Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building brands, businesses, and a career you love with the people who've done it. I'm your host, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into today's story of starting over. It's good to have you here, and I hope that whatever stage of business building you're in, you're being kind to yourself through the endless process of learning and courage that it takes to do it. I am so excited for you to hear this story today because we get to chat with a business builder who's currently in that extra special stage, that time right before you hit go on a brand and business you've been quietly developing. It's possibly my favorite phase to chat with people as, and I'm sure you can relate, It's a time when creativity, emotions, hustle, anticipation, and the learning curve is all pretty well off the charts. It is exhilarating and terrifying all at once. And we're talking about the creation of Marissa's business and product, Joy Roller, but also her work as a photographer and how that's organically grown alongside her as she's building Joy Roller. And this is definitely something to stop down on because it is amazing the things that happen and evolve with us when we just take one bet on ourselves. We might start by thinking it's all, I'm creating this one business and and that's what I'll focus on. But as you move through the professional and the personal undoings, other paths seem to naturally open up. And I just love how one change, one bet on yourself opens the door to so many areas of opportunity and for income. You're also going to hear about how sometimes realizing your why, the thing you didn't realize was driving you, happens well after you've started the journey about the manufacturing process of creating a physical product that until now is just a figment in your imagination, the benefits of slowing down the creation process when starting your business and how it influences what you end up creating when you have the time to think it through and how a lifestyle change often plays a key role in the creation of your business, whether it be to clear up finances, headspace, or simply to have a shift in perspective. And it's the beginning of April for this episode with pre-orders for Marissa's beautiful product set to open later this month. What a time. Please enjoy this inspiring business building chat. Today, I'm here with Marissa Mills, co-founder of Joy Roller. And what exactly is Joy Roller? Well, I want you to think for a second about the old granny cart. You know, the one Nana used to drag it around the shops. Well, Joy Roller is like that, except way cooler. Marissa has designed a modern granny cart that is both stylish and practical, the perfect solution for carrying groceries, but also the from work to gym to home gear and so much more, adding more movement to your every day. With the official launch of Joy Roller just around the corner, potentially by the time you listen to this live, we get to pick Marissa's brains on her journey creating this glorious roller from the initial idea to the final design and where it's heading. Nothing is more exhilarating slash terrifying in business than hitting go on something you've been slaving over for years, something that's lived inside of your mind. And honestly, I think those who back themselves to do it are just the bravest humans in the world. I can't wait to hear about how you got here and how you're feeling right now, Marissa. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Hello. So nice to speak to you. It's so nice to speak to you. I spot a joy roller in the background and I'm very into this color. <laughs> yes, that is Orch. It's uh, definitely ready to go. I love it. It's looking fantastic. So to kick us off, I'd love to know, how would your husband describe you? Oh, he's very kind to me. He would think I'm a little bit quirky, creative. He thinks I'm funny, which is great. I'm not funny to everyone, but he finds me hilarious. That's why he's married to me, I assume a good mom, a go-getter. If I want to do something, I'll just do it. I'm not a gunner. That's a pretty good list. And yeah, I love that. I think you have to have a little bit of just going to do it about you to to enter into this game. And reading a little bit about your story before we hit record, I'm excited to hear all about those gunners that you did. So let's get into that. So before Joy Roller, who were you? I've been many things. I originally was a graphic designer. So that's been a skill that I've had for like 20 years now. So that sounds like a long time. Now I think about it. I was a graphic designer. Then I needed photography to add to my work. So I ended up becoming a photographer, ended up doing that full time. 
And then I moved on and fell into a business which was in the wedding industry. I used to shoot weddings and ran a business called One Fine Collective. We did wedding and baby events. So that kind of took over for a lot of years. And I've kind of done a loop back around into photography, social media, and Joy Roller is our new baby. I love that you say you needed photos so you became a photographer. This Just this need to creation and then just unpacking a part of yourself you didn't know existed and you didn't know you'd love. I think that's just such a, a brilliant example of why, you know what, you just never know what's around the corner. You never know this is going to take you. What was it like learning to shoot photos? Well, originally I wanted to be a photographer straight out of school, but my mum said, that's really hard to get into. And everyone I spoke to was like, oh, I don't know. So many people do it and they don't end up getting jobs. I decided that I would do graphics so I could have that behind me. And then the photography was always a passion. I've been taking photos for ages before that. And then it's like, I just decided I either do it now and work on it or I keep doing graphics. So it just kind of panned out that I really love photography and went and learned more about it, did free work you know, tagged along with wedding photographers and and learnt on the job. Brilliant. What was it like to put yourself out there after that as a photographer professionally? I do struggle with saying I'm something. And then Alex said to me, you know what, you just need to say, I'm a photographer. And that's how you become a photographer. So I'd always go, I'm a graphic designer and I do some photography. And once I started saying I'm a photographer and then I obviously had a good portfolio, I did a lot of free things. I got my portfolio to a point where I was like, yes, I feel really happy to charge and then I could charge more as I went along and my portfolio grew and it it all kind of rolled on from there. So it did take a while for me to step into that. It's just such an interesting experience that taking ownership of the word and the title and what that means in terms of your identity. I had a woman on the show a little while back. Her name is Amy McNee. If you follow Inspired to Write, that's her handle on Instagram and the community that she's built. And she's constantly encouraging the creative community to be like, do you know what? You can own the title of writer now. You don't have to be a published author to own the title of author. If you've written something, you're a writer. If you're passionate about it, you're a writer. And, you know, she goes into all of the other fields as well. If you paint, you're a painter. Just roll with it. You don't have to be told by somebody else that you need to, and pardon the pun, I'll probably say roll with it a couple of times in this chat. (laughs) I don't mean to do that. But owning that and stepping into that is incredible. Yeah, it definitely took a while, but I got there. Yeah, all good things in good time. You mentioned there that you went into something called One Fine Day Collective. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, what it was and and how you got started in that space? Well, we were all in the wedding industry. This is in 2012, so it's a while ago now. And I guess Instagram just started and there wasn't many wedding vendors or wedding events that showcased all the vendors we would work with. We were working with more creative vendors. It wasn't like the tool around the chair and the more traditional. It was more creative couples that were looking for something different. E.g. I wore like an emerald green sequence dress to my wedding. So it was more like that, you know, we kind of started the ball rolling for more creativity in weddings and whatever you wanted to be your wedding day you could create that. You don't have to just have white because everyone else does it. It was more creating something for people that wanted to have something a little bit different for their wedding day, less traditional. So we got all our friends in the wedding industry and just thought, why don't we do an event where everyone comes? We'll have a great time. We get to work with and show off all the vendors we know. And we did it at Sun Studios. Um, We pulled it off really quickly. (laughs) I think it was like, from launch to event was three or four months, which was a massive feat for all of us. There was three of us doing it and one was a stylist and one was a photographer and I was doing photography at the time as well. And I'm a graphic designer. So we had all the things we needed in house. Like I did the marketing I did the graphics and we had all our vendors and everyone shared it. So we got over a thousand people turn up on the day, which was a bit of a surprise. (laughs) It had a real buzz. It was an amazing day. And then it rolled on from there and we started doing events in Sydney and Melbourne and Perth and New York and wherever else. So it kind of snowballed. We didn't set out to do it, (laughs) just saw an opportunity and went for it. That's incredible. What was it like to scale up at that level? What did you have to do to, to get it, particularly for New York? I mean, that feels like a big jump. It was pretty fast. You know, we started with one event 
Then we did another event in Melbourne and then we kind of just kept going and it was a lot, even with three of us. And then we had to hire people. It was quite highly stressful. (laughs) I'm pretty sure we all had a breakdown. All adrenals died, you know, like we all had babies in that time. So there was a lot going on. It was a great time and also stressful. And also managing that growth and what events to do, where to go next, launching other categories, going into baby. That was a big category. And then managing it all, really. I'm not an events person, but I soon had to understand how to run events. Even though I wasn't the main event manager, I would do more of the marketing and the graphics and the socials. And then we had a team. So managing staff is uh, interesting as well. (laughs) And everyone's personality is working in a team of three. Yeah, I can imagine, and particularly under that level of pressure. My partner said to me just this morning while we're recording this, actually, when I was sharing some concerns about things that I'm setting myself up for at a later date and not knowing exactly how to do those things yet. And he just reminded me, you know, future, that's a that's a future Kim problem. You'll show up as the person you need to be in that moment. You don't have to know how to do that now before you actually go. I mean, it really helps to have therapists living in, in-house um, being on this on this journey, but you're right. We learn and we figure it out. Yeah, we're just, everyone's winging it as everyone knows. You just try, give it a go and, you know, you can make it better next time if something didn't pan out. But, you know, we learned so much, so much. And tell me about One Fine Baby. So was that an event as well? Was that something different? How did that come about? That was an event. We were all having babies. So it kind of was the next progression. You get married, you have babies, and then we die. <laughs> <laughs> One Fine Funeral wasn't quite as positive <laughs> as it could have been. No, baby just felt like a natural progression from weddings. would do their weddings and then they'd be getting pregnant and having babies. So we also were doing the same thing. We're in our 30s or late 20s. And next we're like, well, where do we get this baby product from? What's the best baby product? And again, that space was a little bit old school, didn't have all the cool brands that you get now. So we just thought we could showcase the vendors in that area as well. And it started off in Sydney And again, went to Melbourne, just Sydney and Melbourne now, I think. And tell me about the process of stepping away from that, of closing that down. What what triggered you to move away from it and, and how was that process? I was having my second child, Harley. He was a few weeks old. Before I went on maternity leave, I wondered how we'd go. There was a few discussions around selling or a few interested parties, looking at acquiring the events and the business. So, you know, we were having those kind of discussions. And when I came back from mat leave, we needed to have a bit of... um mediation. So we went there and sorted that out. Um, And it came up that Jess and I, the other business partner, we were going to leave it to our other business partner and she can take it from there and we'll go and start some new things or start afresh. It just wasn't going to work the three of us trying to run it. I think there's too many cooks in the kitchen. So that was an interesting time. And we sold out of that business and I thought, I'm going to go crazy. I don't know what to do. (laughs) I'm not sure what else I want to do. I like being in business and I like being my own boss and doing my own things and creating things. So obviously I did have a little baby. I think Harley was like six weeks old. So went to Fiji and we had a little break and I did start working at the horse doing their social media after about four months, just trying to see where I land. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And that opportunity came up, which is great. It was around the corner and they're a great company. And that was a really nice place to work. And in that time, we lived close to the shops again. And I would find myself wanting to walk. I've got this thing, Alex pays me out because I'm always like, I haven't moved today. Like I need to move every day. Like I need to move more. I think it's just because my mum couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair for a while. And I feel like everyone takes for granted movement and that we can walk, that we can move and that we've got health. So I think that's been a bit of a push. I was trying to think of this the other day. Why, why am I doing a granny cart? <laughs> like it's so random and everyone kind of goes, really? Wow. Okay. They're a little bit shocked that that's where I've gone, but people that get it, they get it. And they're like, yes, I've been looking for one of those. You know, I don't want to use the same ones as non up the road. So we lived close to the shops and I was like, I want to go to the shops and walk and bring back my stuff or walk to work. And I've got my camera gear. I've got laptop. I go to the gym and I get a sore back. So when I'm using a backpack, I actually really dislike it. And I would kind of get a niggle in my back. I found a vintage granny cart 
And I was like, you know what? I thought about this like seven years ago or when we lived in Glebe and I was walking to the shops all the time, carting myself back with like all these bags, like struggling with all my groceries. So I wasn't quite ready to do that business then, but I feel like everything came together at this time. And I was like, it's now or never. Let's give it a go. What's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work and we go to something else. We pivot and try something else. So that's how we got to that point. We'd go to the markets with my vintage cart and I just loved it. I just think, why are we not using this? This makes sense. And I just never want to carry groceries ever again. I think you touch on something really interesting. As you're talking the story out, you're realizing, oh, hang on, there's actually a bit of a driving force here in terms of what you witnessed with your mom and how it's influenced you to move more. And you start to see that thread. I think a lot of business owners, you know, brand developers, all of us doing this sort of work, look for the thing, the why, before even going into or just constantly while you're on the journey, constantly trying to find that narrative so that you make sense to other people. I think it's so normal. Yeah. It's only recently I've gone, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's where that came from. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? And how relaxing it feels when you start to see some of that. You're like, oh, okay, I can make sense of this now. Now I know how to tell my story. It's interesting. I often wonder if it's right back to our evolutionary desire to be part of the tribe. You know, God forbid you end up out of the tribe, like back (laughs) in many a yesteryear, you know, you're out there potentially getting killed if you're on your own. And now it seems to translate so much that we just want to make sense to our friends, our family, our ex-colleagues, everybody. We're just so desperate to make it make sense to other people, to be part, to be accepted. Yes, exactly. What would just happen if we just let ourselves do, hey? Let's just just roll into it. Oh my God, I did it again. Um, Again, genuinely didn't mean to do it. Let's stay with with Joy Roller though and actually making that that real. Okay, so you're getting in this space now. You kind of know, all right, I think this is what I want to do. What were your first few steps? We did a lot of research and just thinking, are we crazy? Is this a good idea? Watching what people were doing, who was using it. You know, obviously overseas, Europe, they love a granny cart. The funny thing is with the granny cart, it doesn't have one name. So I find that the weirdest thing or the hardest thing, I put up a thing, what do you call this on a Facebook chat? I got like 30 different replies, but like over 200 people replying. And they all said, you know, I made a list. There's like 30 different names, like granny cart, a chariot, a nonna cart, you know, shopping trolley, a shopping cart. Like this just goes on. And I'm like, oh, wow, really got our work cut out for us. We just want our cart to be called a joy roller. You go, that's a bugaboo. That's a joy roller. So I feel like the name was a problem. Like what am I searching on Google? So a lot of Google searches. Then we were looking for vintage inspiration for carts and they're actually quite hard to find. So my brother knew we were looking for them and found one down in Wollongong and we went down and bought that one. And our cart is actually roughly inspired by that cart. So we like how things back in the day were made to last. They're made to be used for years. They're not going to break easily and they're sturdy. So I just think we wanted to pay homage to that cart So the first thing was that, and then we thought, we have no idea how to manufacture this. It's not a really simple product. And we came across some industrial designers that had done the Husky Cup. And I was like, I like that as a product that's well-designed. And we got in contact with them and they also saw a, a gap in the market and wanted to work with us on that one. So we ended up working alongside them. Alex is really good with the functionality and how things work, whereas I have no idea. Just make it work. I want it to work like this or it needs to look like this. So we had a really good idea, had lots of mood boards together of what type of brand we wanted, what the cart should look like, what we want it to be used for. And then they put together some concepts for us. So that was the design part. And then also we worked with a brand agency, kind of getting the personality of Joy Roller. I found like I was too close to start from scratch. I needed to look back and and it kind of changed from what we originally thought. I feel like it's progressed and because the journey's been so long, it's been good. Normally I've always, things have been quite quick. Like in the other business I was in, it was like, okay, we're going to do this and like let's make it happen now. Whereas this process has taken like three years. So there's been times where I thought we would do this design and then by the time we got there, We totally changed our idea. 
And in the end, I feel like we're in a better space for the brand, for the products and everything in between. So it's been nice to slow down and just take our time, even though it wasn't all of my choice to take my time. I thought we would have had this done in like six months. The industrial designers laughed at me when I said, yeah, so we'll have a product like ready to launch in like six months, right? And they're like, no, 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 no. I would say 12 months at minimum. And I'm like, no way. I had to readjust my thinking. And now we'll probably launch three years later than I originally thought. Wow. So you had done the branding and the tone of voice and that sort of area right back then. And then now you're here. So it's changed a lot since then, has it? I mean, the overarching thing about movement and be bold and stand tall, all those things are the same. I think it's more the look and it's just matured a little bit more. I think. And I've improved my flash photography and things like that. My retouching, like I've been really working on all that stuff. And I've learned a lot in e-com at my last job. So it's a lot of different mixture of things. And I feel like I'm in the best spot to start a business now than I ever have been. So I'm a little bit excited and slightly nervous. Naturally, it's exactly why this pod exists. It's kind of the dark and the light. It all kind of happens together. That's so interesting. I mean, so many people will say it to me as well. And I, and I do tend to roll my eyes when I'm in the thick of it. But you know, life happens for you, not to you. And that delay, how much can grow and change and evolve and all good things at the very right time. But God, it's frustrating when you want to move, isn't it? So frustrating. Alex is always like, you know, it's going to take way longer than you think. Cause I'd be like, yeah, so we're going to launch like in November. He's like, Mm-mm. I would say January. And I'm like, what are you serious? <laughs> like every time he's been right. And I'm like, you suck. You know why? I'm just want it. I'm, I'm ready now. Come on. But we're so close. So I can feel it. It's all happening. How is it working together as a husband and wife duo? I thought you might ask that. Um, It's not the first time we've worked together. Alex used to shoot videos when I would do weddings and he's a sound engineer. So he set me up this sound. Well done. Well done. I look very professional with my ears on and my professional microphone. And we've worked together before in another business we had. So I think we bounce off each other quite well. We can get quite annoyed at each other at the same time, but we kind of just have to let each other do what they're best at as well. Alex is more good at the product and looking after inventory and the website. And I'm more like socials, photography and the look and feel. So if we stick to our lanes, we should be okay. Yeah. And I can imagine the inevitable moments when tensions are high, things tend to get a little bit hairy, but I'd love to, you touched on it a little bit before about working elsewhere and developing skills. I'd love to touch on that financial journey for you. So three years is a long time to get to that new business, that next thing. How have you managed things financially through this build process? I did get some money when I sold out of my business. So that has helped Joy Roller get going. And I also worked three days instead of being fully off for maternity leave. And I don't like not working, I've realized. I feel like I like working, I like learning. And we also decided to make a lifestyle change and moved up to the Northern Rivers a year ago. So that was a big change. We just thought, you know what, let's try it now. The kids are at the right age and we wanted to give Joy Roller enough time that it deserves. So we thought we'd sell our house down in Sydney and move up here and start afresh and take the pressure off trying to work full time and trying to start a business and do the things we love. How do you think that's played into your development creatively and also your professional development in business? The last year has definitely been us settling in and just getting things set up. It's been a year of change, buying things like lighting and, you know, new cameras, you know, laptops. I just feel like we just needed more equipment to then do the jobs that we really love and are passionate about and then start putting our names out up here again. You know, I've been doing photography jobs and I feel like I've left space for creativity. I've never felt more creative up here. So I feel like that's worked really well in our favor. And I think being surrounded by greenery and space has really just taken a lot of things out of my mind. I created like three websites this year. So we've created Joy Roller, created another one for freelance social media and lifestyle photography, and then also created another website to sell my fine art prints. I've had so many photos that I've kept in my little folder. And I'm like, I've wanted to do fine art prints forever. And I had the space to do it. So I thought, well, 
I may as well launch that as well and take more photos. It kind of has made me take more photos, which has been great. God, I love that. I mean, not to to draw the lines here because I think the listener will be doing the same thing, but sometimes just changing something, one thing is enough to open all of these different doors. And not only that, having a few streams of potential income. So a few projects on the go. I mean, I think that sounds like it's been pretty pivotal at your overall growth. That's what I noticed and realized. I'm like, you know what? Like, I don't want to rely on one source of income. That's just silly. Well, it's not silly. It's just not where I want to be. So I'm just trying to use my talents and the things that I think can work for me and try and set it up. And I know it it doesn't happen overnight. I'm not selling a bazillion prints. They're not flying out the door, but I feel like it's just a setup. The setup was the longest part, doing all the images, getting a frame already. Like I've done it properly and I'm proud of what I've done. And then I think anything after that, I'm still happy with, you know, I just think it was such a good experience to do, even for myself to look at the photos and go, oh, I took those, like, that's cool. And, you know, but to have some people hang them on their walls, it's so nice. That is really nice. It's that whole, you don't put all your eggs in one basket adage, isn't it? Like there's something to be said for that because there's certainly something to be said for focus and going after a goal, just single-mindedly too. I think things have their place. It allows you to dial it down. So you get it launched. And then you dial it back and you focus on joy roller and then you dial it back. It's more of a bit of a balance of, okay, I've got all these things. They're all giving me something. Now, which one do I need to focus on in this moment? Exactly. I was getting a little bit antsy with joy roller taking so long. So it was almost (laughs) a nice little space for me to go and go, all right, I've got, I've got control over this. I think I like control and I've had to give up most control with joy roller. So I felt like, all right, That kept me occupied and Alex was happy that I didn't annoy him every two seconds with, is it ready yet? Is Joy Roller ready? Like, are we done? (laughs) And where are you at right now with the launch of Joy Roller out into the market? Well, production finishes next week and then they got to get packed up and shipped over. So I feel like it's pretty close. I don't want to put pre-order up until I know they're on a ship because I don't want to push it out and I don't want to have to say, oh, sorry, like your order won't be fulfilled till later. Like that's just not a good way to start. So I would think in it should be all launched within late March or April. And then we're going to the big design market in May in Melbourne. So that's a bit exciting. Oh, that is a bit exciting. Well, by the time we do release this episode, and certainly for those who are listening back, let's hope that This is live and it's out there and timing is working well so we can send listeners there. But we'll touch on that at the end of the episode. That is exciting. So going to the design market, what's uh, what's the thinking around that and, and how are you feeling about that experience? Well, obviously running events, I think events are good for brands. It's good for people to see things in real life, chat to us, see how it works and just show up in person. I, I think you can't beat in person events and seeing things in real life. I'm all about e-com, but, you know, occasionally I think events is really, really good to see who your market is, meet them in real life. I think you're so right in that space. It's like that kind of human experience, isn't it? Something textile that you can touch and it allows the bit of the word of mouth to start to happen for you. Yeah. And also after COVID, obviously events are back. So I think now is the time to just get back out into the real world. Oh, I so agree. Thank God that's over. Uh, what are your hopes? Well, let's not speak too soon, Kim. Let's just knock on some wood here. Um, but what are your hopes once we're live and it's launched? What are your hopes for Joy Roller? I just hope people find them as handy as we do and want to use it and want to roll and stand tall and be bold and get out there. They're not for nanas. I mean, nanas have their own, but this is, you know, more for the younger generation that just would like to walk more leave near the shops, you know, especially you might not have a car. If you're living in the city, I didn't, you know, I lived in London for two years. I didn't have a car. I think so handy if you're in a unit block and you want to roll down to the shops, go to the local farmer's markets. If people can love it and use it, I'd be super happy. And we've got lots of plans for the future, but let's start there (laughs) and then see what happens. Take over the world. No, um, one one roller at a time. (laughs) We do have other products, so we don't want to just be doing carts. We do want to branch out into other areas as well. So that will be rolling out over the next couple of months. There you go. You just gave yourself your own pun rolling out over the next couple of months. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
It's easy. It's an easy it one. It is an easy one. Yeah, there's a, there's a TikTok account in there already, but it is a really beautiful product and you can just look at your Instagram even with, and I love the, the way you've done that. You've shared so much about the inspiration behind it. You've shared so much about color palettes in a really interesting way and lifestyle vibe what what it can give to you all before you even have a product to sell. Was that a choice that you made consciously? I wanted to show how it was made and so people could see that we were designing it from scratch. We're big on details. We're big on functionality. So we've taken so long because we did change things so that it did function better than it was. And we got recycled fabrics. The cart is lightweight aluminium, so it's very durable but light. So it was all those things. Originally, I did start Instagram to show the journey so people could appreciate that it is designed from scratch and follow along, along the way. I just didn't expect it to take this long. So I thought they would see probably behind the scenes for like a year and then we will launch. So, you know, people have been very patient and we have lots of very beautiful followers that touch base and are really keen to get one in real life. So I can't wait to actually be able to say it is now for sale and you can buy one. And thank you for being such an amazing loyal follower. Yeah, that community build certainly can't be overlooked. People do get really uh, invested and it's just if you can be really open and honest through the process I think it's just one of the greatest tips but it's also a really amazing product and it's really exciting to see it it's about to launch out into the world so as it gets live as it's out there things are happening you've shared so much today with your experience on the journey and you know that's such a gift to give so how can the listener and I support you on the journey getting this out into the world? I would be super happy if you wanted to jump on Insta and follow us. Support would be amazing. Just follow us on Instagram. I'm trying to start TikTok, but you know, I'm a bit slower on TikTok. So we'll have plenty of things to share at Joy Roller is the Insta tag. And then join our EDM. We are send out not spammy emails just once a month. We'll be keep in touch and just follow along and see what we create next. Amazing. Honestly, Marissa, sharing so much insight into your journey and so many lessons about the art of following your instincts and following your creativity and letting things come back to you. I just think is such an incredible lesson for all the people listening to take away. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with me today. I wish you nothing but the best for a huge, amazing launch. And I said this to you in emails before, I can't wait to get my hands on one. I got my eye on that color in the background and I can see myself rolling farmer's market vibe, laptop in, might start chucking my pod gear in there and just do pods on the go. Uh, So I just am so excited for you and so grateful that you shared your journey and your experience with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been so good listening to you as well. Oh, thank you. I forget that people listen. (laughs) No, it's just us talking. No one's listening. It's good. (laughs) It always feels that way, right? You just throw things into the abyss and hope that it provides value for people. So thank you for saying that. No worries. One quick thing. If you're hearing this, you've listened all the way through. Hopefully that means you really like this podcast because it's pretty generous to give up 40 odd minutes of your time for it. If that is the case, please leave the show a star rating and a review. It helps me reach so many more people who might also listen all the way through and get some benefit and some support out of it. Not to mention it puts a real spring in my step to read them. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the stories of starting over with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid. See you there.